Buenas ti, how are ye? Welcome back to the Candle of Tales podcast where we tell Irish myths set to live music. My name is Aaron and in this episode we're continuing the series on the Fianna with the story of the kidnap told by my sister Surika. To listen to our reflections and chats and support this podcast, you can join our Candlelit crew by following the links in the description and the show notes below. And just a quick note about our live storytelling shows taking place at the end of October and start of November. We have upcoming shows in the Irish Whiskey Museum for three days and a show in Powers Court on the 2nd of November. Check out our website for more details on these live shows around Halloween for our Samhain storytelling. But for now, hey Sarka, tell us a story, will you? Leo Lilcra had never planned on having children. It was not something she had aspired to. It was hard work, thankless work, although Bomal did thank her. The child never did. She found herself on the edge of frustration more often than she liked, on the edge of snapping. Bomal, Bomal took to it differently, but sometimes she thought no more naturally than herself. Bomal was a woman of subtle rhythm and great insight. The noise, the constant motion of Demna was exhausting. Leah Lucre did her best to tire him out, to take him out into the forest, to show him things, to watch over him, to keep him out from underfoot. She found a good game. There was a field nearby full of hares, and as soon as the child was big enough to walk, she'd put him in the field and tell him, now don't let any of those hares out. Bomal would sit with the child in the evenings, ask him to tell her everything that he'd learned, tease out the lessons about the world that he'd observed, confirm to him what he'd got right, gently steer him with what was wrong. Between the two of them, they could manage, but there was never enough time. There was never enough time for themselves. There was never enough time to sit by the fire together and enjoy the peace. There were little snatches of it in the evening, but time to hold, time to be together, time to savour one another. To talk long into the night, to wake slowly in each other's arms. These were the times that they never had. These were the times that were constantly cut off by the child's needs by the child's questions, by the child's curiosity. They neither of them wanted to snap at Demna, but it was difficult. And Bomal couldn't swear to herself that her method of teaching him to swim was entirely motivated. In the child's interest, throwing Demna into a pool of water and letting him find his own way out. Well was how she had learned to swim but she couldn't really lie to herself she'd also been on her last nerve with the boy pestering her to learn so it just felt satisfying he did find his way out of course she wouldn't let anything happen to him but they both found their eyes meeting more and more often finding their tempers frayed, finding themselves in need of a break. And eventually, Bomal proposed it. We could send him away. Where are we going to send him? Eild McMorna, Gull, I should say, is hunting him still. We could send him with poets. If he's with a poet, a poet's apprentice, Gull McMorna won't hurt him. No one, no right-thinking warrior in the country is going to attack a poet. 
And where are we going to find a poet? Well, that Beaumont knew the answer to. She knew a troupe of poets. Every year they gathered at Crotte Clerc. And that evening, by the fire, Beaumont told them the story of the harper Clerc of the Tua de Danan, who could play two harps at once and played them together weaving harmonies for a whole year, trying to woo and win the heart of Bov Darug's daughter. All in vain. Why? Demna asked. You can't force someone to love you, Bomal answered, but even in the answer she felt his attention drift away. It was a two-day journey to Krotha Kliuk, to a place where, even then, the sound of the fairy harper's notes could be heard on the wind, and there Bomal's friends were gathered. She greeted them. She introduced them to the boy. And she promised that she and Leah Lulcro would return in a month. After they'd had just a little time to themselves. And what a month it was. They finally had the time to lie in each other's arms. To talk, to be quiet together to listen to the sound of the blackbird, to listen to the burble of the stream, to go about their work uninterrupted. And it was lovely. But they found themselves confessing to each other it was very quiet with just the two of them. And they found themselves missing Demna's chatter, missing his energy from time to time, thinking about him more and more often, with absence making their hearts grow fonder still of the boy. They told each other stories of him. They wondered how he was getting on. And sooner than they might have thought, the month drew to a close, and they were ready to get him back and bring him home. But on the way to Crotacleoc, Bomal went pale. She said to Leah Lucra, Something is wrong. Something's very wrong. Leah Lucra did not wait to hear more. She knew Bomal's instincts, knew the way that she had of seeing through the veil and into the other world. And so she ran cutting down that distance with her hunter's lope, cutting it down from two days to one. Before too long, she could smell it on the wind, blood and death. She ran faster. And she found a slaughter, there by the lake, the bodies of poets strewn about. One by one she went to them, She looked them over, searching first for Demna and then for signs, her hunter's eyes, the tracks on the ground, the footprints, the wounds in the bodies. By the time Bomo caught up, she knew that Demna was not there and she knew this was not the work of Ead McMorna. Even with only one eye, he was not so blind as to attack a poet. She turned to Bomal to tell her, and Bomal, with a strange look in her eyes, said, His name. His name is Fiacul, son of Kotna, and his ancestors cry out his disgrace from the other world. Well, Leolucra said, that makes things easier. Do these spirits know where he lives? And if he took the boy with him? In fact, they did. They led Bomo to a marsh. Leah Lucre could see the house in the middle of it, positioned so as to make sure that no one could approach with any cover. It's a bad setup. 
But Bommel was sure, with a conviction that Leah Lucre knew better than to question. Demna was within the house, that he was safe. That even this man, savage enough to attack a poet, was not so far gone as to kill a child. But what else he might want a boy for was something that chilled both of their blood, something that they did not speak of. They waited for dusk and Bommel called a mist to shroud the place, to cover Leah Lucre as she slipped into the grey, disappearing from even Bommel's view. Her footfalls made not a single splash. Not a bird nor an insect was disturbed. Inside the hut, Demna woke up. He'd cried himself to sleep that night, as he had the night before, and the night before that. Terrified of this strange man. But he felt, as he woke, that he had been waiting for something. He didn't know what, but there had been something in between him and despair. And then he heard voices, the strange man's voice, gruff and frightening, and another voice. And his heart leapt in him when he heard that other voice. Leah Lulkra. Let the boy go, she said. And why should I? The man replied. If you let him go, I'll go. If you keep him, I'll be back. And the next time I'm back, you won't wake. Demna found himself standing by his foster mother. And she led him back through the marsh. He clung to her hand and the mist around them was so thick he could not see. But he looked down and stepped where she stepped. And his feet did not get wet. And then, Bomo was there, sweeping him up in a hug, enveloping him in her comforting warmth. And then, he cried again. This time, not alone. This time, safe again. This was what he'd waited for. He'd known that they would come for him. And as Bommel comforted Demna, Leah Lucre slipped away again. She had not wanted to shed more blood in front of the boy. But she was not going to leave this man alive. She'd send him back to his ancestors. And they could tell him what a disgrace he was. Back in Sleeve Bloom... It astonished Leah Lucre how quickly the boy seemed to settle. Back to his chatter, back to his old self. Just as exhausting as before. Just as full of brightness and chatter and questions and more questions. He's resilient, she exclaimed to Bommel, but Bommel said, Wait. She waited and she watched him. And when he woke in the night crying, the dreams of poets and their deaths, she was there to comfort him. And at the fire he began to speak, to tell them of what happened. And Bommel would hold him at the frightening parts, but he would always go to Leah Lucre at the end, for she had brought him back through the marsh. And he asked them, Are some people nice and some people mean and Bommel said yes more or less and Demna said but some people are dangerous are they all mean and Bommel said well is Leah Lucre mean and Demna said kind of but she's not scary but she's dangerous said Bomo. Yeah. So how do you know? How do you know and not be afraid? If someone is nice or mean or dangerous? 
Well, that takes a long time, said Bomo. So how do you not be afraid? said Demna. You know, Leah Lucra interjected, if you want, as you're learning how to tell the difference, I can teach you how to be dangerous. Bomal tisked and looked at her. Isn't he a bit young? We'll tell that to the world, Leah Lucra replied. The world doesn't care that he's young. The world's dangerous. You can learn to be dangerous too, little Demna. But it won't be easy. You'll have to hurt. You'll have to learn how to take a blow. And how to give a blow. And no one's going to stop if you cry. Are you sure? Demna squared his little jaw and looked at her across the fire. And he said, yes. I want to learn. I want to learn how to fight. And the very next day, Leah Lucra began to train him as a warrior. <laughs>